My name is Harold Noble. I was originally born and raised in Steamboat Canyon, Arizona, in the Navajo Reservation. And I've lived here ever since. In my earlier years, I was raised as a sheep herder. Friends, as I live in the Navajo land, raising up as a Navajo traditional man. My grandfather was a medicine man, and his brother was a great medicine man too. And so I live among these great Navajo elderly whom I respected. During that time, I have learned that the gods that we have are to be feared. There are certain times that, that you would talk about him, not, especially not in the summertime, but it is always in the wintertime. You know, that to me, when I got saved, when I got to know the Lord Jesus Christ, I've come to know that God is listening anytime. He is the God of all season. That makes the difference. And I used to fear God. His punishment are very severe as I learned. But the word of God here says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the wonderful God that all Indians should know and should come to know. Of course, earlier years, my grandmother, who loved me very much, and I respected her and my grandfather. My grandmother especially was very interested for me to be taught to be a Navajo medicine man. I said, okay. You know, a medicine man chooses whoever is capable of listening and understanding. And so this is what my grandmother saw in me, the ability to listen and to think. And so she asked my grandfather to teach me. Father, you're going to teach me the ways of Navajo. He lifted up his hand. Look around you, he said. The mountains, the sky, the earth. To learn the Navajo way, to speak of sacred things, be close to it, be part of it. He said, these things can't be learned indoors. They must be learned while sitting on the earth's floor. Come. I will tell you about the Navajo way. Of course, earlier years, my grandmother would sit by me, and I would be sitting in the middle of Hogan with my grandfather. And my grandfather taught me from the beginning of the four stages of the world for me to learn. My grandfather said, look around, and it'll help you to understand more things. 
It will cause you to ask questions. And so I did. I looked up to the skies, and I looked up to the mountains, and I looked up and go out and listen to the wind. When I was herding sheep out there among the red tip, I had lots of friends out there. And I sing and chant among those and respected them and to treat them with respect and, and worship. When I was learning from my grandfather, I had lots of questions. And I asked him, who made this world? Who made the mountains that you taught me? Who made the river? And who makes the, the sky? And of course, my grandfather told me, you'll have to wait on that one. I will teach you later when I come to the end of my life. And I said, grandfather, if I should leave before you do, what kind of a Navajo would I be if I didn't know that? I said, in the graveyard, I see small grave and then medium-sized grave and large grave. So people die any time in their youth and up to their old age. That tells me, I tell him, that life here isn't sure. So if you're telling me to wait until the end of your life, what would I be if I should die before you? Would I be in Navajo? Would I go where the good Navajo goes? Of course, he said, everybody dies. If you really want to know that right now, he says, you have to pay. Four strands of white shell beads, if you want to know right now. I am your grandson. Isn't that be enough to tell me about these things I'm asking? He says, no. The requirement is the payment. The four strands of white shell beads. And I says, grandfather, I don't have it. And you don't have it. But when I come to an age, I'll buy you four strands of white child beads. I wanted to know who made the world, who made the mountains. And I even asked him for a hint of this person. You know, I'm glad the Bible, the word of God, doesn't require that. It requires faith from your heart. God knows that we don't have anything that is of value that he can accept, but by faith. This is very important. I'm glad that we don't have to pay anything besides faith. Not everybody has turquoise. Not everybody has gold. Not everybody has ruby. I don't have anything. I'd never wear gold. I don't know yet. But uh, when I get to heaven, I'll walk on. The Bible says, by faith. We all have faith. And by faith, we come to Jesus Christ. For salvation. By faith, we serve Him. We don't have to have white shell beads to learn from the Word of God. It is free to those that want to know and to serve the Lord. I went out into the world to, to learn other stuff and, and confronted with the, the alcohol. And that held me. That conditioned me to, to rely on that. So, I began to have problems. At first there was a lot of fun, but later on, it controlled me. And so I thought, what is there beside all this that I've learned from my grandfather? Especially the time when I found myself in jail in 1960. I get in there. December 25th, a Christmas day. You know, I got drunk again in Gallup, New Mexico. And I don't know where I was picked up. All I know the next morning, I was glad 
that I was in jail. Because it made me to think, what am I doing? Because in a Navajo way, you only have four chances. So I count my fingers how many mishaps I've had, major mishaps, you know. And I really came down to three. And I have one more chance. I said to myself, I better do something. This got to be good. I could have been gone last night. It put fear in me. Just that time, I heard a bar door open on the other side of that jail cell. Of course, I didn't mind because all night through, we've had more drunks come in, staggered all over. And I said, some more drunks are coming in. To my surprise, you know, I heard them singing. I might have been a Christmas song, but I didn't know. But I heard them singing. It's a tremendous privilege to be here today to share the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with you. As we meet here in the Gallup Jail on a Christmas morning, we want to remind you that Jesus Christ loves you. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And there's a message of hope today for you to know that can give you the second chance. I looked and the man was holding the Bible and was preaching from the Bible. We're celebrating Christ's birth, God's Son who came to this earth almost 2,000 years ago. We want you to know that God loves you. When he says that he has come to seek and to save that which was lost, I want you to think about that being a personal invitation to you. And while I was there, I heard the gospel. And the man read the scripture. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. My, I said to myself, there is the last chance. I am go. I'm going to go to that book that I saw that white man held. And I said, I'm going to go to that book to see that, that word, if it's in there. And I will believe. The Lord loves you, and he wants you to know that this is not just a white man's book. We read in Romans chapter 10 that the same Lord over all is rich unto all that will call upon him. Maybe you'd say, well, you don't know my past. I've, I've got financial problems and legal problems, family problems. I've been struggling with alcohol. My life is a mess. My friend, let me encourage you that we serve a God who will give you another chance. He will set you free. If you'll put your trust in his unchanging word, he will never let you down. What God says you can count on. My friend, many times here on the reservation, we hear that this is a white man's God, that this is for another people. Let me encourage you that God's word tells us that he is the same Lord over all, and he's rich unto all that will call upon him. This book is for you. This message is for you. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And today you can put your trust in Jesus Christ as your personal savior. I prayed many years ago. Uh, Lord, save me from my sin. I put my trust in your death, burial, and resurrection. I believe that you have died as uh, the penalty for my sin, and I accept this pardon. My friend, you're not on death row today, but spiritually, we are on death row. And the Lord wants to take us from death row with that pardon that he's paid for with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Please let me implore and plead with you. Friends, like all the good preachers would give you a, uh, an audience how to get saved. And I believe he done that. Because I remember telling God, Lord, save me. 
if you are real. If you can do something with me, Lord, whatever that may be, whatever it's worth, I have messed up my life. Maybe God has spoken your heart today and brought conviction about the sin in your life. Maybe God's brought you to a point where you're willing to give your life to Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you to pray a prayer like I prayed many years ago. Dear Father in heaven, I recognize that I am a sinner, that I need a savior. I've made a mess of my own life, but I want to give my life to you and give you charge. I repent of my sin. I turn around and I give control of my life to you. I trust you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. Lord, use my life. I want you to be my savior and I want that home in heaven that you've told me about. Praise God for John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I believe with all my heart that God could raise up some men in this place, an unlikely place, that could go out and preach this message even better than I can and reach their own people for Jesus Christ. My friend, consider this message. May God's Holy Spirit work in your heart. May God bring conviction in this day that the Holy Spirit might work in our midst. We went to court and had our hearing. When my turn comes for the judge to sentence me, the judge said right off, young man, you don't belong here. You have something else better to do at home. I want you to go home. Make use of yourself. I believe some of these were words from God. The judge has seen something good in me. And you know, even God before the foundation of the world saw him something good in me. And I praise God for that. My home was about 85 miles right. northwest. Yeah, there. thanks. There was a truck that I came near. So I said, would you give me a lift? Oh. They said, go ahead, come on in. <laughs> of course, you know, they would drink. Uh, no, thank you. I don't drink no more. Of course, you know, it went around. And I saw them doing that before, but you know, this time they offered me to drink. And I said, friends, I don't drink. I don't drink no more. Of course, you know, they kind of ridiculed me and going around laughing about me and stuff. And so about that time, we kind of got in the argument in the back of the truck. And on the other side of Window Rock, they, they headed south from there on the dirt road. And there they stopped. And the argument was really hot then. They all jumped out of the vehicle and they started fighting. And one of them pulled out the truck jack and we fought there. I ran uphill. Of course, I was in a good shape then. I went uphill and from there downhill. But when I went down the hill, they were throwing rocks and stuff like that after me. And I outran them. And from there, I went toward St. Michael. And I dare not go back to the highway. I find myself sweating all over. You know, my father warned me one time in the winter never to get your horse run or make him sweat. And this is what I'd done. And I was in trouble because of that, because I was steaming. From my jacket, I would see steam come out. But I went and hitched a ride anyway, and I, I was given a ride in the back of the truck again. It went about four miles from there, I walked. And it was getting dark and it was cold, and I knew that that night I would die. But I thought, you know, I gave my life to the Lord. I wonder if he would come and help me. But I said, it is okay if I die. In those days, of course, you don't find many vehicles on the road that we have today. The traffic was very, very, very slow. We don't have very many vehicles at that time. And as I was walking, a man drove up by me. Thanks for 
stop it. You need a rag? Yeah. How far you hit it? It's a little ways. It saved my life. Oh boy, it's cold out there. Things are stopping. And so I sat there with all my sweat and I was tired at the summit. I said, man, he's, he might be going to sawmill and I'll be walking again. But you know, to my surprise, I, I woke up right, right there by the summit junction and he passed on the same road that I was going to go on. And I look at him, I said, how far, sir? It's a little ways. So I thought he met Kinsichi Junction. And to my surprise, you know, after a while we took a little sleep again, I woke up right by the Kinsichi Junction again, and he passed on to the way I was going to go. And I asked him, looking at him, I said, how far, sir? A little ways up ahead. A little ways. He kept saying it until he made a right turn at the Salani Junction on the dirt road. And I asked him again, how far? Just a little bit more. But he did come to my surprise, you know, he, he went as far as where my father and mother lived down there with the sheep. And I told him, this is as far as I'm going, sir. So he stopped for me and I got out. Thanks for the ride, mister. You know, when I started to walk, and then I thought, I better wave him a goodbye, you know, so I turned. There was no truck. And I said, well, he probably went, went away fast, you know. And so I walked. I was glad. I came home. My mother and father. My wife was working in Pine Spring. So she came and got me at midnight. We went home. This is how my life began with the Lord. Next Sunday came, seems like a long time. I went to church. You know what? I had to walk because I lost all the credibility to drive. My wife wouldn't trust me, so I walked. That's all right. I understood. I understand what she was thinking. But so I, I left home early and went down to Good News Mission, where I went to church the first time. At 10 o'clock, I was there. And I've attended the service for, I, I wanted to see what the Word of God was saying. Let's open our Bible to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God, that you may thou you in the due time. Cast all your care on him, for he cares for you. Now in Navajo, I call a yago at our tada kiss. The in God will lie, your God zili, yahoka. I called up a evens and good a ya. But you know, after the uh, service, everybody was walking out and I was here with no, no Bible. I really felt empty with no Bible. And so everybody went out and I, I started to go out. And I saw it, which looked like a trash can out there, a box, an old box. In there I saw a small Gideon Bible. You know, I went in there and I, I have a look around first. There was nobody around, so I took one of the Bibles and stashed it into my back pocket. And I left. This is just fresh out of stealing, you know, so I knew how to steal. I thought that I was stealing the right thing. But God knew. But I walked home, you know. I took it slow because I had plenty of time. So I would sit and read 
I felt that I have stolen some of the greatest thing, you know, the Gideon Bible. And I thought, well, I've got all day to spend. I'm not in a hurry to get back home. Even if I come back at midnight, be all right, I thought. It was so precious. It begins with Matthew, you know, New Testament Gideon Bible. You know, it didn't take me too long to come across that, that verse where I've shared with you. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. I praise God, you know, I, I was laid in bed when I was reading and I just jumped up and said, here it is. It's true. And so from there, I made up my mind that this word, which is called Vilagana Bazaar, Vilagana Benahawa, white man's religion, that's what Navajo called. It's no more white man's religion, it's my religion. It's the word for me, for my life. I began to read with more freedom. But then conviction began to take over me. First I thought I'd go back, tell the missionary lady there that I stole her Bible. Oh, uh, ma'am, uh, last Sunday after church, I took, uh, actually I stole a Bible. Really, which one was it? Actually, it's uh, one of these little Bibles. They were in the box back there, and I just took one and walked out with it. Oh, that's not a problem. You didn't steal anything, Mr. Noble. And she says, Harold, that is there for you to take, you know. And I was so happy. I said, you mean this Bible is mine? She says, it's yours. It's yours to keep. Those Bibles are for people to take, so you didn't steal anything. Oh, you no, know, okay. you can keep that one, but we do want you to read it. Well, thank you. And I have been reading it, and I'll continue to read it. Good. Thank you. I went home happy, and I didn't, I didn't have to hide it to read it. But that began my life. Friends, I've been so good. The Lord has been so good to me. And the Lord began to use me there at the church, leading, singing, the scripture reading, little at the time. The Lord was so patient with me. And His Word began to grasp in my life. And I began to grow. In 1969, we were praying for a missionary. We all said that we need another missionary. All this time I thought, well, I was praying, so I always pray for a white missionary. And that was my concept, that the missionaries are the white people. And I began to deal with God concerning missionary. And I said to the Lord, Lord, where is this missionary that we're praying about? I've prayed now for two years. What happened to him? And the Lord seemed to say to me, I've waited two years too. And then, the day, of course, you know, I got the message. And I said, no, Lord, no, 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 not, I'm not a white man. Lord, I'm an Navajo. I don't have anything. But the Lord seemed to say to me, you have my word in you. And you have salvation. What more is there? Isn't that go ye written to you? Have you come across it? I said, Lord, yes. Is it written to you? I said, yes. I could go around, you know. I keep going around and try to avoid that. But by the Lukachuga, Arizona, I stopped arguing with the Lord. I says, okay, Lord. Of course, I've been putting more condition on my call, you know. And when I get home, I'll tell this to my wife. If she, she's happy, that means I will go. So when I got home, told my wife, you know, this is what the Lord is saying to me. She says, okay, that's good. And so she was happy. And I said, I said, I've got to have some more conditions. So I said to him, Lord, Lord, if, if I go and present it to the church at Good News Mission, and if they don't agree, I will, I will not bother with it. If they say I were happy, I will go along with them. So at that Sunday, I said, I have this uh, heavy burden in my heart. And out here in Navajo country, we're in need of uh, missionaries and pastors to our own people. I've been praying about this and it's been very heavy on my heart. I wanted God to send someone 
send someone out here to Steamboat, but you know, he's been talking to me and it's like he wants me to go. So I feel like I'm ready to become a missionary to my own people. Today I'm here to ask you if you would maybe support me in my idea. Maybe God does want me in Steamboat. And if you can give me your approval, um, I'll just leave it up to you. You know, everybody trapped and, and they were happy and I said, we will be our missionary. Okay. You know, I found out it doesn't take a van or four wheel drive or whatever to become and serve God as a missionary. So I've served almost four years at Good News Mission as a missionary among my people. From there I prayed. The Lord opened the door to do the service at Pine Spring. I built one Hogan church there, under that church. But people needed the gospel out here at Steamboat, Steamboat Canyon. One Christmas Eve, I had a visit. And that, that visit turned out to, to be a determined when I should start here. I have a problem here. Um, I know I'm saved and I want to get into, you know, more into um, the Bible and I like to get to know the Lord more and get my get myself you know into it and what do you think my brother that came to know Jesus Christ here said to me where is there a church that preached the Bible yeah well I know brother we don't we don't have a church around here yeah you know, I like to learn about the Bible more and sure. I want someone to you know um, I almost think about you, you know, that's, yeah. we should start a church here, you know. Hey, then that's we, a good idea. Well, then we could go and you know what, I've been thinking the same thing and... Uh... And I said, I will come and start a service here the first Sunday that year, 1973. Oh, hi Rose. Oh, hi. Hi. What are you guys talking about? It's like... And his wife came up behind him and says, What are you talking about? What are you two talking about? My brother said to me something very important. We're talking about a church. And uh, that's when you get people saved, and just like you, you might get saved too. Mm -hmm. My brother said to his wife, Honey, are you saved? She says, I don't know. Of course, I came in and I said, would you want to know now? She says, she would love to. Well, let me just read you scripture, okay? Um, in Romans 3, 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. Mm -hmm. I've been really concerned here. I see the need here in Steamboat. And I'd like to see a lot of my relatives, my people here in Steamboat to be saved. We don't know our future tomorrow. You know, personally, I've given my life to the Lord and my brother here. Some should happen to us tomorrow if we die. I'm very confident as a born again Christian, I know where I'm going, I'll be in heaven. And um, you know, we, we can't get into heaven just by being good or just going to church, but you have to be certain, you know, you have to, you know, confess your sins. And I'll pray and then you can just follow me. Does that okay. sound good? Okay. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. We come before you tonight. We come before you tonight. I confess my sins tonight. I confess my sins tonight. And thank you. And thank you. For Jesus, your son. But Jesus, your son, you sent here to earth. That you sent here to earth to die on the cross. To die on the cross and to redeem us. And to redeem us from our sin. From our sins. I give my life to you. And I give my life to you. I would like to be a child, a child of God. And I would like to be a child of God. Come into my heart. 
And I ask now to come into my heart. And save me for Jesus' sake. And save, save me for me. Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. I pray. Amen. And his wife got saved that night. So we've started a work here in the small building. The first Sunday we had, there was five families represented. People began to get saved. It was winter. So I took my people down to Grants, New Mexico. That's where I baptized eight converts. And we built a, a Hogan church here. So this is our Hogan church that we've been in for a long time. And friends, Navajos came to know Jesus here. A lot of Navajo people went back with the Lord. They're in heaven. Friends, I'm very happy that Jesus called me worthy to preach his word to my people. God needs your heart. He needs your life that is in tune with Jesus Christ. Grandsons, it's good to be here in this beautiful country, Navajo land. Now we're going to sit down here and I want to share a story with you about some things that happened in my life. Uh huh. So, then just check it on this side. Huh? I'll be bashful. Yeah, I want you to listen, guys. See, uh, uh, we have, as a Navajo, we have many uh, stories, events in, the, in our land. I've learned about his son, God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ. How he sent him to this earth to redeem my soul from my sin. The penalty of, of sin. And he died on the cross to pay for my son. And now I am his because he bought me. I'm going to tell you about a story that happened long, long ago that happened to my great, great, great grandmother. The father and the mother and this little probably eight-year-old girl and her name was Miss Sage Asansa. And you know, the, during the summertime, there used to be a lot of harvest down there in Chinle. So they saddled up the pony and rode early in the morning for Chinle. And so they arrived in Chinle because there's a lot of harvest of corn, squash, and fruit. And they wanted to, to, to taste some of those good things. So they rode the horse down there. Oh, about noon time, they arrived and you know, all the corns were cooking. Meats were being broiled. And Oh, it smells good. They were hungry, so they said at the place where they serve all that beautiful corn, fresh corn, melon. And so while they were participating and taking this, you know, all of a sudden, everybody began to run around kind of nervously. They didn't know what to do. What's going on? And they said, an attack. The youths are coming. The youths are coming. So everybody fled. The, the food, everything was just there. And they ran off, you know. And so they went to their horse where they tied their horse up. And they went over there and her mother got on the horse and she went and sat behind her and they started to ride away, you know. Before they start out, and all of a sudden, some youth man came by them, hold the rein and turned their horse this way. You know. Chief White here, he rode up and took the little girl. He grabbed her and he said, this is mine and I will use her. He grabbed the little girl and put her behind him. And, and so they rode off. And the mother on a horse was let off too. They camped several days and they were gone because every night they were tied down together and so they won't run away. But one night, this little girl's mother found out that they, she was loose. And so they untied themselves and they, they went on this way. They went on toward the mountain and that's how they escaped. They missed them. They were looking around for a while, but you know, it was night, so they settled down. So they, they went up to the foot of the mountain and they stayed there three days until the enemy passed by and they started coming this way. So the little girl's mother came back and she told 
her friends, relatives. The little girl's father already began to work on what he's going to do, you know. So he started uh, to ask everybody, you know, make some rugs, Navajo rugs. And they did that, you know. In about three months' time, there was about a pile of rugs and with a beautiful pony and some silver work and a saddle and led the horse all the way to Fort Pledge, you know, where the youths are. The chief white hair was over there. While, you know, while the little girl was taken over there, she was put to work, you know, with other slaves. But, you know, all these youth girls were picking on them, you know, ridiculed, you know. They just made fun of them. And then one day, of course, they, she got used to the rid being ridiculed. These older girls said to her, your father is here. <laughs> and they said, what a joke, you know. My father is here? And they said, yes. And they're way over there on a hilltop. And you're going to go over there. She didn't believe it. That's just another joke, you know. That's another tease. She didn't believe it. But you know, a little bit after that, Chief Whitehair came over, rode his horse, leading another horse. And he said, jump on this horse. And so she jumped on that horse, and, and they started going that way, you know. She saw a figure on the hill up way out there. So that's where they were going. And there were some riders up there, and a pony, something on it. And so closer and closer they got, and you know, it was surprised that it was her dad. You know, she would tell the story, you know, with tears. How her father came into the uh, enemy land, in the Ute country, to buy his daughter back. And she would cry, you know. Uh, she went that far and cried. So my grandmother named that story the unfinished stories. She would go as far as talking about her father redeeming her back from the white hair, the youth chief. The youths met the chief and the and the men, the Navajo men that, that came down there met and talked about it. They made an exchange. They said, We'll give you all this work. We'll give you all the silver work, and we give you all the saddle and the horse. It's yours if we, if you can, bring our daughter. Oh, oh yeah. chief said, "Okay, okay." See, that's what Jesus Christ did. You know, God, His Son, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to redeem us, to get us from the power of sin, to free us. That's how He brought us back. That's a redemption story, wonderful, wonderful story and a wonderful word. Remember that, my grandchildren, redemption is what God did. He redeemed us. He sent his son as, as an exchange. He let his son die on our place, on the Calvary's cross, so that we could be free from our sin, the penalty of our sin, the guilt that the, the, the Lord God laid upon his son. And, and he paid the penalty for us. So I said, God loves us. My God's love is so great. We need to really consider this, my grandchildren. He is good. He loves you. You know, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's us, that, that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the wonderful God that all Indians should know and should come to know. I am glad in the Bible, the Bible says by faith. It requires faith from your heart. God knows that we don't have anything that is of value that he can accept. But by faith, and by faith we come to Jesus Christ.